Hi there. My name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech. And in the last lecture of EC 3400 Analog Electronics, we looked at the kind of effect that the capacitors in a transistor amplifier can have on the low frequency response of the circuit. In the next lecture, we'll take a look at how capacitance, particularly parasitic capacitance, can affect the high frequency response of a transistor amplifier. And a useful tool for that is something called Miller's theorem. So in the setup to Miller's theorem, we imagine we have some amplifying circuit that has a gain of negative A, where A is a positive number. So this is an inverting amplifier. Now, I'm not saying anything in particular about the input impedance of this amplifier. We're assuming that we're taking a voltage source and jamming it right here, and that voltage source is ideal. So... Let's now imagine that we add a capacitance around this amplifier. Maybe this is a capacitance we've added on purpose, but this might be some parasitic capacitance that's part of the amplifier circuit that we don't like, but we have to live with. Let's denote the current flowing into the left side of the capacitor as I1 and the current flowing into the right side of the capacitor as I2. Of course, I1 equals minus I2, but it'll be convenient to have these labeled separately. I like to compute the impedance looking into the left side of the capacitor. Notice that I'm very careful to draw it so we're looking into the left side of the capacitor. We're not looking at the input impedance looking in this direction. Whatever input impedance the amplifier has, that's something else. So we can say that I1, the current flowing into the right side of the capacitor, is VI minus VO over the impedance of the capacitor, which is 1 over capital CS. Now, notice that I'm using lowercase letters here to represent variables as a function of time, and I'm using uppercase letters here to represent their Laplace transforms. So I'm not using V here to represent something like a DC circuit value and the lowercase letters to represent the AC circuit value. This is differentiating between Laplace transform and original function. So if you're not familiar with this kind of Laplace transform notation, you can think of S as just a placeholder, and you substitute in J omega to get the frequency response. So let me take the denominator and the numerator here and multiply it by CS to put CS up there. And what we'll do is we'll take this minus AVI and substitute it in for VO. So I can then factor out VI and write this expression here. So if I want to know what the impedance looking into the left side of the capacitor is, it's the voltage at that node divided by the current. And if I plug in the current, then the voltage winds up canceling, and I wind up with 1 over 1 plus A times CS. So I could define a new capacitance that's just 1 plus A times the original capacitance. Let's call that C1. And I could write this impedance as 1 over C1S. Now, let's look at things from the other direction and look at the impedance looking into the left side of the capacitor. So I can write I2 equals VO minus VI over the impedance, which is 1 over CS. So this is like the expression we just saw for I1, but I've just flipped VO and VI. So here, if I want to write everything in terms of VO, I can divide both sides of the expression here by A, and we can wind up with 1 plus 1 over A VO times CS. And we can wind up then saying that Z2, the impedance looking into the right side of the capacitor, is that voltage at the output here divided by I2. And when I plug in the expression for I2, the voltages again cancel. So I wind up with this expression here. And let's again define a new capacitance as 1 plus 1 over A times my original capacitance. So we can write this impedance as 1 over C2S. The point of all of those calculations is that we could replace this circuit with a circuit with the amplifier sandwiched between two capacitors going to ground. This C1, that's C times 1 plus A, 
and the C2, that's this C times 1 plus 1 over A. So for large A, C2 is pretty close to C. And we'll see in the next lecture, just by some weirdness of fate, you often wind up with better results in practical computations if you ignore this 1 over A term. And that's just a thing that happens. That's not necessarily because A becomes large. It's kind of weird. Now, the really interesting thing is this C1. This aspect of Miller's theorem gives you something called the Miller effect, where this capacitance that you see here actually winds up getting heavily amplified. So the capacitance that this voltage source sees is a lot bigger than what you would otherwise normally get if you just had C sitting there without this feedback loop. And the more gain you have, the greater that effective increase in the capacitance is. And independent of the question of the Miller effect itself, this kind of schematic is often a lot easier to reason about in a broader circuit analysis context. Now, I showed you Miller's theorem with a capacitor here because that's how we're going to be using it. But this overall approach works if you replace this with some other generalized impedance. I'd like to hand wave a little bit about superposition to try to get some intuition about the Miller effect. So if we're thinking about the current flowing into the capacitor here, let me forget about VO for a moment. So let's imagine grounding this side here, and we just have VI. And I guess we also need to cut the wire here. Well, if VI goes up, then the current I1 goes up. Now, on the other hand, let's imagine zeroing this out here, and then we have VO. Now, VO is minus AVI. Now, that seems weird because I just said, hey, I just zeroed VI. But remember, using Marshall Leach's method of superposition with dependent sources, we don't actually solve for the variables in the circuit until we have all of the contributions included. Now, there's this minus sign here. So effectively, when VI does go up, the VO over here goes down. And if the voltage over here is going down, then we wind up with a current being pulled this way. So on the left, you have current being pushed into the capacitor on the left. And then you have the output of the amplifier pulling current out of the capacitor on the right. And actually, the effect of the output of the amplifier is the stronger effect. So if you add up both of these contributions from the left and from the right, of the voltage source and the output of the amplifier, what you'll see is there's more current flowing through this capacitor than you would normally otherwise have. And what that means is that the effective impedance seen at the input is lower, which means that if you think about the impedance as being 1 over CS, the equivalent capacitance is higher. How's that for some hand waving? If you didn't find that satisfying, Feel free to ignore what I just said there and just look at the math in the previous slides. Miller's theorem and the Miller effect have been known about for a long time. And if you check out Miller's original paper, it dates to 1918. So Miller was doing this original work in the age of vacuum tubes. And actually, I have a lecture on the Miller effect in vacuum tube circuits in my guitar amplification and effects class, which you can check out if you're interested. Now, if you're not one of my Georgia Tech students, you can check out here. But if you are one of my Georgia Tech students, I would like you to log onto Canvas and you'll find a quiz called Fuzz Quiz. And your answer will be one of the names of the Beatles. So I'm interested in your viewing habits of these lectures over the course of the semester. And I would like your honest opinion. I'm just going to collect some aggregate statistics. I'm not making any personal judgments here. So which of the following statements most accurately describes the way you generally approach the lectures this semester? John, I eagerly watch them the day they're posted. Paul, I watched them within a couple of days after they were posted, sometimes watching a couple at a time. George, I'd wait for a few to pile up and then binge watch them at a convenient time. Ringo, I'd watch them all in a panic the night before the homework was due. So type John, Paul, George, or Ringo, depending on which seems most accurate on average. Again, I'm not making any personal judgments here. I just want to get a feel for things.